This is Ludwig's Maximilians University in Munich. On the morning of Thursday, the 18th of February, 1943, Professor Claude Huber was giving a lecture on philosophy. In the meantime, brother and sister Hans and Sophie Scherl were in the atrium of the university. They had a suitcase full of leaflets written by Kurt Huber and edited by Hans Scherl and Alexander Schmorell. The siblings laid out the leaflets in the university building and apparently unseen, they decided to go home. However, it would appear that they realised that they still had some leaflets and went back to the atrium. Sophie threw the leaflets over the balcony, but this time she was seen. The caretaker, a locksmith named Jakob Schmidt, saw them, rushed to them, declared them arrested and hand them over to the head caretaker, Albert Scheithammer. The two were then brought to the 40-year-old university administrator, Karl Ernst Hefner, and rector, Walter Wust, who in turn notified the Gestapo. The Schultz were then taken to the Wittelsbacher Palace, the Gestapo headquarters on Brienerstrasse in Munich. The Schultz were members of an anti-Nazi resistance organisation called the White Rose. They produced six leaflets which were distributed at various locations around Germany, sometimes by post. Over the next three days, the Schultz were subjected to the Gestapo interrogation. They initially denied being involved, but a search of the house provided the Gestapo with the materials for making and distributing the leaflets. They both confessed on the 19th of February 1943. In their confessions, they attempted to protect the others who were involved. On Monday the 22nd of February 1943, the People's Court, chaired by Roland Freisler, was convened. Freisler had come to Munich from Berlin specially for the trial. He sentenced Hans and Sophie Schull and their friend Christoph Probst to death. The death sentences were carried out almost immediately the same day by beheading. In a short time, almost all of the other members of the resistance group were rounded up. Many of them were executed. Quite a lot has been written about the resistance group, including several films, and much is known of the Nazi People's Court. On this channel, amongst many others, one can find information about it. However, what of the caretaker who detained the Sherls and set off the whole chain? In this video, I'm going to look into his background and, as always, his post-war fate. Jakob Schmidt was born in Traunstein on the 25th of July, 1886. From 1913 until 1916, he was a mechanic at the Technical University in Munich. Schmidt was called up and participated in the First World War in which he was wounded. For his service, Schmidt received the Ludwig Cross. This cross was inaugurated by King Ludwig III of Bavaria on the 7th of January 1916 for those who rendered special service to the Bavarian army or to the welfare of the state through voluntary work at home during the war. Around 90,000 Ludwig Crosses were awarded. On the 5th of October 1926, he was employed as a caretaker and locksmith looking after the lecture halls at Munich University. His job is sometimes described as that of porter. There is a case in a Munich police file from the 9th of June 1934, confirmed by a memo dated the 16th of June 1934. Schmidt was working as a caretaker and had just cleaned the courtyard. Shortly thereafter, a six-year-old threw something into the freshly cleaned area. Schmidt went to the six-year-old and his four-year-old brother and hit them so hard that the younger one's nose bled. Until the Nazis came to power, he was a member of the Catholic Workers' Association as well as the Barbarian People's Party. On the 1st of November 1933, he joined the SA, and on the 1st of May 1937, he joined the Nazi party. This was quite common. The usual reason for joining was not belief in the party, but rather the need to continue in employment and enjoy the benefits that party membership offered. And, of course, to avoid the problems that non-membership threatened. I would also point out, uh, as far as this is concerned, that I actually urged people to join the Communist Party in Poland in the 1980s. Uh, as uh, anyone who knows me will confirm, I was a very strongly anti-communist, but I thought that that was the only way to actually change the system. 
and indeed to potentially get on. When Schmidt handed the shells over to the Gestapo, he did so, or so he later claimed, because leaflet distribution was forbidden and not because he believed in the Nazi system. However, as early as the Monday following the arrest of the shells, his appearance in the court was described thus by the higher regional court councillor Otto Berzold after the war. The witness Schmidt came in. The effort he was making to impress was noticeable, bending his back and giving the Hitler salute with his outstretched hand. However, his presence was not required. The public prosecutor said that there was enough evidence and that Schmidt could sit on the bench and watch. The People's Court did not need witnesses as the accused had fully confessed. What was needed was a quick show trial. Otto Betzold commented later that when Schmidt didn't get a chance to speak, it seemed as though he was disappointed. He had the feeling that Schmidt hoped to step into the world spotlight. If that is true, then this hope later came to pass, although probably not in the way that Schmidt hoped. A propaganda event was organised in the university in the Auditorium Maximum on the day of the trial, the 22nd of February 1943. Nazi officials hoped that this would serve as a public statement against the actions of the White Rose, while Sophie Schell expressed the hope that her death would lead to a revolt in the student body. The Nazi press claimed that 3,000 people attended. The rector of Munich University, SS Oberführer Walter Wurst, reported to the Reich Ministry of Education about what had happened. In this demonstration, the Munich student body first expressed their contempt for the machinations of those four traitors in an unusually impressive, even moving way, at the same time as showing their determined will to fight and win, their unshakable loyalty and willingness to devote themselves to the leader and to the people. At the time he said this, there was only four people who were known to have taken part in the White Rose. Of course, more names uh, came uh, out later. This statement is basically confirmed by the report of a student, later reported in Michael Gutner's 1995 presentation of Students in the Third Reich. The student remembered the triumphant appearance of Jakob Schmidt, who had arranged for the rest of the Schell siblings four days earlier. The rally in the auditorium maximum is one of the scariest memories I have of those days. Hundreds of students cheered and stomped to welcome the informer Schmidt, who took it standing and with his arm outstretched. Paul Giesler, Gauleiter of Munich, Upper Bavaria and the Prime Minister of Bavaria, promoted Schmidt to squad leader and awarded him 3,000 Reichsmarks a sum which I suspect was well over one year's wages for him. In 1934, Schmidt had caught a thief on the premises of the university and had asked for a reward but not got one. Nine years later, he received a sum few could then dream of. The war did not go the way that Nazis would have wanted it to go. This film shows the liberation of Munich on the 30th of April 1945. However, there were German units that had attempted to liberate Munich before the Americans got there. On the 27th of April 1945, Captain Ruprecht Grengoss, chief of the interpreter company of Verkreis 7 in the Tsar barracks in Munich, attempted a rebellion. On the evening of the 27th of April, Gerngross ordered his troops to line up at the Saar barracks. He released the soldiers from the oath of allegiance to the Führer. The following day, Gerngross and his comrades in arms occupied two transmitters in Munich from which they called for a cessation of all hostilities and proclaimed the goals of the Freedom Action Bavaria. Attention, attention, you are listening to the radio station of the Freedom Action Bavaria. Get rid of the functionaries of the National Socialist Party. The Freedom Action Bavaria has taken power tonight. 
Unfortunately, it was not to be. Nazi authorities were still in command and the SS and Gestapo cracked down on the Freedom Action Bavaria. Gerndrossner's men had to flee. The SS managed to capture some who were murdered. Other revolts occurred in Augsburg, Dachau and Pensburg. In the former two, the revolts were successful. Nonetheless, the Americans kept on advancing. If anything, these revolts might have hastened their advance by diverting SS and Wehrmacht from the front line. Munich was where Adolf Hitler had a private apartment. It was here that Hitler had emigrated in 1913 from Austria, here where he had joined the Bavarian army in World War I, where he had joined the German Workers' Party, here where he had taken control of the Nazi Party, here where he had led a putsch against the German government, and it was here that he probably considered his hometown. Munich was very much the cradle of Nazism, and that was why it was so urgent for the regime to destroy the White Rose. Berlin might have once been red, but Munich was always brown as far as the Nazis were concerned. Hitler expected every man to die fighting for Munich. He didn't get his wish. On the 29th of April 1945, US troops approached Munich encountering light resistance. They entered the city the following day without encountering any significant resistance. As can be seen in this newsreel, the locals welcomed their liberators. Around one hour after Hitler committed suicide in Berlin, Munich Town Hall was surrendered at 16.0500 hours. The highest ranking Munich national socialists, such as the Gauleiter Paul Giesler and the mayor Karl Fehler, had shown their support for the fighting to the last breath for their Führer by running away. There had been heavy street fighting in Nuremberg but not in Munich. The liberators were welcomed with flowers by the locals. In order to celebrate, some Americans popped into Hitler's private apartment on Prince Reagan's Platz and helped themselves to whatever they could. Other Nazi targets and warehouses were also looted, not only by the soldiers, but also by the locals, now freed of their Nazi overlords. Some Munich residents now demonstratively presented themselves as Bavarian patriots. The white and blue flag of Bavaria hung from many windows and discarded Nazi party devotional items lay on the streets. This marked the end of the Nazi era in Munich. The supreme commander of the Western Allies, General Eisenhower, then noted in his order for the day, the entire Allied force congratulates the 7th Army on the capture of Munich, the cradle of the Nazi beast. By the end of the war, 90% of the historic old town and 50% of the city as a whole had been destroyed in 73 air raids. Over 6,000 people died in air raids and around 15,000 were injured. The number of Munich residents who died in the Second World War is estimated at at least 33,000. As a result of evacuation and flight, the population fell from 824,000 in 1939 to 479,000 immediately after the war. Munich was part of the American occupation zone. On the 4th of May 1945, Karl Scharnagel was reinstated as mayor of the city by the American occupation forces. On the 15th of May 1945, a staff of 32 American officers arrived in Munich. In the following months, their number rose to around 200. Under the leadership of Charles Keegan, they formed the expanded US military government in Bavaria called the Regional Military Government. The goals were to rebuild an administrative structure, take measures to reorganize everyday life, provide supplies to the civilian population, and oversee denazification measures. Such was the fame of the White Rose that Jakob Schmidt should have considered himself a marked man immediately on liberation. Indeed, he was arrested quite quickly on the 11th of May 1945 and spent 13 weeks in prison. He was released only to find himself locked up again soon afterwards. 
On the 12th of July 1945, Schmidt was sacked from his job at Munich University. After liberation, people had to fill out a form describing their political activities from 1933 to 1945 as part of the Law on National Socialism and Militarism of the 5th of March 1946. On the 25th of August 1945, an article appeared describing the events of 1943 in the Münchner Zeitung. Here one could read, two students were observed by the university porter Schmidt and this informer informed the Gestapo. That's not quite exactly what happened because he informed his boss who then informed the Gestapo, but never mind, it's the same sort of thing. After the end of the Second World War, the American military government passed the Denazification Act in 1946 and set up arbitration tribunals, appeals chambers, main chambers, a court of cassation and the Bavarian State Ministry for Special Tasks, for which they were looking for irreproachable German lawyers. Karl Mayer, who had been mayor of Donauwort and Neuburg and the Donau, volunteered. He was sworn in as chairman of the 10th Munich Arbitration Chamber on the 16th of April 1946. The very first accused to appear before his court was none other than Jakob Schmidt. This was on the 15th of June 1946. The trial was attended by Colonel Keller of the American military government, the Bavarian Prime Minister Wilhelm Högner, Bavarian Minister of the Interior Josef Siefried, and Deputy Prime Minister of Bavaria Albert Rosshaupter. Mayer began with a speech thanking the Americans for the confidence they had shown in the German people by placing the implementation of the Liberation Act in German hands. He said, We want to prove ourselves worthy of this trust and do not want retaliation, not revenge, but justice. The hearing lasted four hours and the deliberation half an hour, considerably longer than the trial of the Schell siblings, which had resulted in three death sentences which were immediately carried out. Schmidt was sentenced to five years in a labour camp, loss of his pension rights and was forbidden from holding public office. The matter attracted a great deal of attention. The newsreel reported on it with a film. A picture of the court and a more detailed report appeared in the Süddeutsche Zeitung twice, numbers 46 and 49 of 1946. Minister President Hergner said that he had nothing to complain about the conduct of the hearing by the chairman, who had chaired a court hearing for the first time. Schmidt appealed against this verdict twice, but without success on the grounds that he merely did his duty. The content of the leaflets did not interest him, but the distribution of leaflets in this university was forbidden. He was released early from prison and his pension entitlement was restored in 1951. He died on the 16th of August 1964 and unlike many perpetrators, he is not forgotten. ZDF produced a made-for-television called ZDF produced a made-for-television film called The Caretaker, Der Fidel, in 1971. In the 1982 film The White Rose, he was portrayed by Axel Schultz, and in the 2005 production Sophie Schull, The Last Days, by Wolfgang Fregler. Links to films will be pinned in the comment section below and in the uh, uh, description, if they are available. I think it also might be worth mentioning the fate of the rector, Walter Wust, who had organised a show of approval and support for the caretaker on the day of the trial and execution of the Schell siblings. Walter Wuss was born in Kaiserslautern, Germany on the 7th of May 1901. He'd been a professor since 1932, a member of the Nazi party since 1933, and an SD informer since 1934. SD is a security service. In 1941, he was appointed rector of the University of Munich, and as such, Wuss played a leading role in the organisation of the sciences serving the Nazi state. In his inaugural speech of the 5th of May 1941, he made an unreserved commitment to Ionism, the belief that a race of people originating somewhere in India ended up in Germany in the Nordic countries and was thus the master race. And that is what the Nazis determined to be science. On the 31st of July 1945, he was dismissed as rector and shortly afterwards, Wuss was arrested by the occupation authorities. He remained in the Dachau internment camp until 1948. 
he was dismissed from the University of Munich in 1946 by judgment of the main chamber of Munich on the 9th of November 1949, Wust was classified as an incriminated person in the denazification proceedings and sentenced to three years in a labour camp, which he had already served with internment imprisonment. After submitting several affidavits, the sentence was reduced to six months and his fine of 1,950 marks was reduced to 500 marks. As a result of the proceedings, he lost half of his assets, which were confiscated to be used for reparation purposes, as well as the right to pursue his profession. However, he was later able to publish again on the subject of Indology, that is the study of history and cultures, languages and literature of the Indian subcontinent. He never again worked in a university, but he did manage to get back the title of professor in 1951. He worked privately on a journal he founded. Wust died on the 21st of March 1993 in Munich. Perhaps I can now conclude with a little bit of my own analysis. Jakob Schmidt did not consider denouncing anyone for political reasons. He claimed that he did it because leaflet distribution in the university was not permitted. Clearly, of course, that was not a matter for the Gestapo. It was a matter for the university. So, as he couldn't punish the students himself, he reported this to his superior who passed it on to his superior, who in turn informed the Gestapo. Although, of course, the chain of reporting the matter to the Gestapo began with him. The reports of his behaviour in court, for example, were made by people who had disgust for the Nazi system after the war. The Gestapo relied on denunciations, like most secret police organisations. Most of those that denounced others were women, but of course once the war started there were more women to do it than men. Denunciations were often secret and could be used to get revenge on someone or to get a business or social or other advantage over the victim. Reinhard Heydrich, no less, had been aware of this and had decreed on the 3rd of September 1939 that unwarranted denunciations were to be punished. Nonetheless, they continued. Another reason for a denunciation was direct personal gain. Schmidt gained a lot from this. Recognition from the student body and the respect that would have gone along with it. I presume that most students would have known who he was. And as I remember the people who did the same job when I was a student, I presume that people at Munich University knew very well who he was. He also got a very large cash reward, something well over a year's wages. How, however, he could not have known of this at the time of reporting the Schell siblings. Of course, he did detain the siblings. He didn't let them go. I suppose they could have escaped, but they didn't try to. He is remembered as the most evil character in this story, much worse than that of Robert Moore, who interrogated Sophie Scholl and has come out of this quite well, or for that matter, his boss, Oswald Schaefer, who had already killed thousands of people when he was head of an Einsatzkommando. Maybe... We don't like Jakob Schmidt because people generally do not like snitches. So Jakob Schmidt got what he wanted. He got fame. I'm even doing this video now on him. So he should be quite happy with what he got. If you're interested in this type of thing, biographies of people from the Third Reich, maybe even biographies of some of the lesser known characters of the Third Reich, then you might want to subscribe. I upload every Friday at 20 hundred hours. I live in Poland and Germany. I travel around in my motorhome. In fact, I live in my motorhome. So if this is the sort of thing that, that you're interested in, then please uh, subscribe. I also upload at other t days, uh, such as uh, sometimes I might upload something on an anniversary or uh, something of that nature. So uh, if you subscribe, then you'll know when I'm uploading. I also do live chats as well from time to time. And if you're present the live chat, then you can correspond uh, in writing, of course, <laughs> in real time uh, with me and with other users. But for the moment, thank you very much for watching and all the best from me.